Welcome to It's a Woman's World, a show which discusses any and all topics under the sun from a woman's point of view. Here's today's moderator, Nadia Giordana. Hello and welcome to It's a Woman's World. I'm Nadia Giordana and co-hosting with me today, Junita Flowers. Hello, how are you? Good, and how are you? Good, thank all you. All right, good to have you here today. Thank you. And then we have Gloria Van Demeltrat. Thank you, Nadia. I'm happy to be here. I think this is a fun show to do. I'm excited to have you on this show today, too. Oh, thanks. And Anne McKenna, welcome for joining us and being one of our co-hosts today. Hello. It's good to be here. Mm -hmm. And my guest is, our guest today is Jessica Gordon-Roth, Ph.D., mm -hmm. And you are an assistant philosophy assistant philosophy professor at the University of Minnesota. Tell us a little bit about what philosophy is in general, and then we'll find out some more specifics. Sure. So thank you so much for having me. Um, it's really exciting to be here. Uh, so. What is philosophy is probably the biggest philosophical question uh, <laughs> that there is. Um, but generally, philosophy is um, the pursuit of knowledge. So it's a quest for knowledge, really. Um, and within philosophy, we have a number of different subtopics. So um, many people are familiar with ethics, right? What ought I do? What's best to do? Social and political philosophy, what, what kind of government is best? What counts as justice? Uh, what counts as fairness? Um, metaphysics, right? What are the constituents of the world? Um, philosophy of religion deals with questions about God's existence, um, things like that. Uh, personal identity is one of the subtopics of metaphysics that I'm interested in. So the question that it asks um, is what makes anything a person, right? So what makes you a person and maybe your puppy not one as much as you, you might love him. Um, and then what makes any person the same over time? So despite the changes you've undergone, why do you think that there's a you that persists through all of these changes? Uh, so philosophy really is an umbrella under which a lot of different things that we uh, think of as pursuits of knowledge fall. Um, so that's the general picture, but it's a really hard question to answer. It's very deep think, subject. And when you say philosophy, so what does philosophy shape? Um, does it shape best practices in certain industries? Does it shape the norms for how we will build other topics of conversation or interest? Mm. What, what impact does it have on all this knowledge that you're gaining? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. So, I mean, some areas of philosophy do have impact on best practices or policies. So especially those that are working in social and political philosophy um, and ethics, right? There's a lot of, I think, back and forth between those working in the discipline and those working to make policy. Um, you know, especially historically, it was the case that philosophers had a huge impact on the kind of policies that were put into place within governments. A little bit less so now, um, but certainly our government could use some ethicists doing some work, most likely. Um, and you know, in other, other ways, I think we inform other disciplines. So uh, another area of philosophy is philosophy of science. So um, a lot of times, philosophers are trying to get clear on sort of the fundamental questions of science. And so there's a back and forth. We're getting information from the hard sciences or even the social sciences. And then also, we're asking the difficult questions that are informing their practices as they unfold. So I think it's very much a, a two-way street. Um, but that's a great question. And is everybody it, always right then in philosophy? Because if of you're- Of course. You no. quest for knowledge. <laughs> yeah. Like, is anyone ever I mean, I, kind right. of joking, but seriously. Yeah. Like, because you can always back up your research yeah. with an argument mm -hmm. based yeah. on the findings that you've looked for to help shape your argument. Like, how does this all work? Yeah, no, so that's another excellent question. So this is one of the things my students wonder when we first start. <laughs> you know, can I just say anything? <laughs> I'm like, well, not, you can, but not really. Um, so yeah, it is the case that I think, especially in these really difficult questions, right, the small topic, does God exist? You're going to get people on both sides, and they're going to have really good arguments. Um, and so it's all about how well the evidence matches the conclusion, or how easily you draw the conclusion from the evidence. Um, I think at the end of the day that philosophers fall into different camps. So there are people who think there really is a truth 
for a fact of the matter, and they're trying to hone in on what it is and develop their arguments from there. Um, there are folks, I think, who after a while see philosophical conversation a little bit um, akin to how people might see legal conversations, right? Mm -hmm. So you might not necessarily believe the conclusion that you're arguing for, but you see that there's a lot of evidence that when it you know, comes together is evidential for that conclusion. Um, yeah. You know, I, I'm curious about women's role in mm, philosophy. Yeah. And it's a man's world. It began as a man's world. Women are evolving, getting involved in things. How did women get involved in philosophy? So that's a great question. Um, well, so a little bit of background. So in philosophy presently, it depends on how you count, but about um, only 17 to 23 percent of philosophers are women. Hmm. I would so, have thought maybe oh, even less. Yeah, yeah. although 17 percent is not a good number. That's and then when you get to the high research institutions, right, R1 institutions mm -hmm. like the University of Minnesota, the numbers become even smaller. Um, so it's it's not great. It's one of the worst um, disciplines within the humanities, and it's more akin to some of the harder sciences in terms of statistics of numbers of women participating. Um, so it's interesting. The question that you raise, I think, is a really good one because we <laughs> tend to think that historically women have not been involved in philosophy, mm -hmm. have not been philosophers. Mm -hmm. One of my strands of research um, involves this very question and I think to some degree women have always participated um, on a smaller scale in terms of number, but they've been there all along. So That's good um, to know. Socrates' teacher mm -hmm. was Diotima. Um, Socrates is supposed to be, right, along with Plato, one of the founders of Western philosophy, um, one of the philosophical greats. So that, I think, is significant, and it's often cast over. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you look to the period um, that I work mostly on, the early modern period, so uh, 17th and 18th centuries, you do see women doing philosophy. Um, and there's a great movement right now, a significant movement, to uncover these women and their works. Um, so one of the things I think that ends up happening is that there are women participating in the time period in which they're living. A lot of times they're taken very seriously. And then over time through history, we erase them. Um, so and that's a rather bold claim, but I think that there's, there's evidence for this. So you see in the 15th century, people wondering where the women were in philosophy in the 14th century. And, and you go back. Right now, right, I, I have this terrible feeling that, you know, 200 years from now people will say, well, why weren't there any women doing philosophy mm -hmm. in, you know, the early 21st century. I hope well, it doesn't carry through that. Long. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a question, and it's a thing I think to be aware of mm -hmm. um, as we think about the kinds of people we include in conferences, the kinds of people we publish, uh, the kinds of people we include in our um, edited volumes, to make sure that women's voices are included. So, what what um, what benefits is philosophy? How does it benefit? For example, women world, women leaders, um, yeah. what benefits is it? That's a great question. So um, I take it that one of the most important skills that you get out of training in philosophy, and this can happen by taking just a few philosophy courses mm -hmm. or majoring in philosophy or pursuing graduate degrees in philosophy. Um, but one of the things that you learn is what counts as an argument, mm -hmm. what counts as a good argument. What kinds of mistakes do we make in reasoning? Right? There are these patterns that people tend to make in mistakes in reasoning um, called fallacies. Right there, you're getting really important skills. Right? What could be more important as a global citizen than understanding whether what someone's telling you is an argument and then having the skills to determine whether it's a good one? Right? And so, a good way to do it. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Right. So mm -hmm. what should be the kinds of rules of engagement in argument? Um, you know, should you believe an argument just because you like the conclusion? No. Um, but that's the way people sort of tend to think before they get philosophical training. So I think one of the key things is um, really learning how to decipher arguments and whether they're good, and then that makes you better at making good arguments. So does that, I mean, it goes hand in hand with research then? Yeah. Uh, philosophy and research? I would say so. I mean, so I think um, if you look at what's going on in our country today, right, figuring out whether you should believe what someone tells you, whether they're a good source of information, mm -hmm. is something that's really, really important. Um, but in terms of other everyday skills, right, because a lot of 
students come into the philosophy classroom and they, they don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't have philosophy in the pre-college years. They love it and then they think, but what on earth would I do with this? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So yeah. what do I tell my parents? How will this get me a job? How will this get me a job? Right. And those are really good questions to ask because education's expensive. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one thing is I would urge people not to think of education as a transaction, right? So mm -hmm. I pay my tuition, I get my grade, I get my degree, I get my job. Mm -hmm. um, but we do all face practical concerns about what we do when we're done with our two-year or four-year degree yep. um, or beyond. So I, I would say that instead of asking what can you do with a degree in philosophy, the question rather should be what can't you do with a degree in philosophy? Um, so Historically, uh, philosophy majors really are well prepared, better prepared than most majors um, for things like the LSAT, the GRE, the MCAT. We score along the lines of the highest. Sometimes there's you know, someone in the hard sciences that will sneak in there with something like the MCAT. But really, in terms of standardized testing, because of the things I mentioned before about learning about argumentation and reasoning, mm -hmm. We're at the tops of those kinds of um, testing or evaluation. So there are a lot of students who then go on to do law or policy or, or things like that. Um, but really, I think any job's going to require you to, to know how to Pretty suss out information, out. Write, read something and figure out what it says, mm -hmm. and then figure out how to write something about it. Um, and those are the skills that you get in philosophy classrooms, right? Thinking critically and then being able to, I think, express yourself more clearly than you could before you walked into the philosophy classroom. It sounds like the debate team would be a great thing mm -hmm. in school for philo philosophical um, majors or people who are looking to go into that field yeah. would be in debate because it would give them a, a root it in seems speaking like it. about mm -hmm. it. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, there so they is this go tie. hand in hand. Yeah, there is this tie between um, debate teams and, and rhetoric clubs right, and philosophy right. speech. and speech, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, a while back I had the opportunity through a foundation called the Squire Family Foundation to bring philosophy back to the classrooms of um, my alma mater, which is an all-girls school. Um, and it was great. I was able to help them integrate philosophy into the curriculum, where really they only just had an ethics class that they didn't have, actually, when I was there. Um, and yeah, I think getting students to have a taste of philosophy in those early years, I mean, children, even way before high school, are asking philosophical questions. They just don't realize that that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can sort of grab onto that and highlight these are important questions to be asking. Mm -hmm. um, even though you can't easily get to the answer, that's actually what makes them There important. isn't anything like that in a high school curriculum anywhere that, that I know of. Am I, I correct? So. I don't think so. I mean, I don't know. I just moved to the area. I know in some um, schools on the East Coast, particularly independent schools, there's a move to mm. start philosophy in those classrooms. but. It's really it's, a um, good idea. it's missing. It's a mm -hmm. it's a thing that's missing from most curricula. So um, yeah, but debate team is a great way to yeah, get students yeah. realizing, you know, these are the kinds of questions that we ask and that are important. Um, but in thinking about how I came to philosophy, um, it's funny because when I was asked earlier, how did you decide on this? I said, you know, I went into the classrooms of Wheaton College in Massachusetts, didn't know what I wanted to do, and then suddenly I found myself in the classroom asking the questions I liked asking. But really, it goes back way further, because I remember one night being very worried, and I think I was maybe five or six, um, <laughs> that my mother, that I wouldn't be able to tell if my mother was a robot. Not because she was particularly <laughs> robotic, but, but I just wouldn't be able to discern, right? No matter what like yeah. criteria I came up with, I thought, but I could still ask. Maybe she was just made really well, and I wouldn't yeah. be able to tell. Oh, so, interesting. Yeah. So, wow. I mean, it starts very young, and I think if you, you know, celebrate these kinds of questions, right, when That's your amazing. child keeps yeah, asking yeah. how or why. I, I'm I'm thinking younger levels, like elementary oh, school. Yes. We it, this sounds like something we really need to encourage <laughs> children yeah. to start asking questions. How can we do that? Or so I mean, it just is you know, there any kind of movement? Yes. Right? 
makes yes. you a better student. It does. Makes- and if they're already asking the questions, right? I mean, most kids are asking, how did I get here? Is right. there a God? So most what does it mean to be there. a good person? Yeah. yeah, but usually it's quieted for mm-hmm. other more practical questions. Yeah, I think right? you're right. Or, or because you're a parent and your kid is asking you 30,000 <laughs> questions. <laughs> exactly. At yeah. some point, you want to embrace and, you know, cultivate who they are. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, actually, we have to go. <laughs> right. Yeah. Is there, We're is, late. <laughs> is there any kind of movement to get this, this type of class or course? or just a small piece of it in our elementary schools? I mean, so like I said, the Squire Family Foundation, I think, is doing great things to get philosophy um, into curricula. And there are programs that they're developing, but there's no sort of nationwide Mm -hmm. movement for this. And I would... Well, <laughs> I would think well, particularly yeah, right yeah, now yeah, there would yeah. not be a mm-hmm. huge nationwide movement for yeah. this. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think that it's something that needs to be done. Um, so I think that any time that there's the opportunity, that, I mean, this is something that's on my radar for being a recent, um, you know, recently moving to Minnesota, I would think that if there's a way I could get involved um, on top of all the other things I have to do. I was but gonna ask that. In I the Twin Cities. If you would. Be Maybe up the challenge to mm-hmm. do something Maybe. about it. I mean, I have to get tenure, and I have an eight-month-old daughter. So a those busy. two things, yeah. just a little <laughs> bit busy. But I mean, I, I do think it is really important, and it's especially important um, in more underprivileged um, communities, right? Because mm-hmm. these are the communities that get overlooked anyway. And these, this is where these skills, right? You don't need to just know how to take a test. You need to know how to think critically. Mm-hmm. And so I think it would mm-hmm. be. A fantastic program um, in the Twin Cities. In for anyone looking for leadership roles, yeah, just right, like right. we were talking about an hour ago with a, another right. guest on the program, right. was uh, leadership, and it's it's going to be extremely important to be able to think like that if you're thinking about leadership Absolutely. roles. Absolutely, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it's a hundred percent. I think foundational. Um, you represent your profession well. I mean, you speak about it very enthusiastically, mm-hmm. um, and you relate it to every day life kinds of things where when you think about philosophy or even like my philosophy 101 professor totally boring like there's yeah. nothing that would ever make me want to pursue it so I think it has to do with diversifying it and having oh, more absolutely. fresh you know people with perspectives and maybe it's women I don't know what it is yeah. but from my experience with just you know that entry yeah, level one course class mm-hmm. stuff, I'm like oh my gosh I'm like done. when yeah. am I done because it was even the lecture style was very yeah. you know sort of the stereotype of what you think when you think about philosophy yeah. not relating it to every single thing that you do and pretty much yeah. any career that you decide to move in so you represent your profession very oh, well thank you <laughs> I did ask my students so I'm teaching two courses this term one's a grad seminar on my general research area, but the other one's an introductory level class um, called Philosophy and Cultural Diversity. Um, So the goal of the course is to expose students to questions that have been asked throughout the history of philosophy and asked presently, but by a diverse cross-section of philosophers as authors. So this, I think, marks a significant um, departure from the way philosophy courses are usually taught. So this is the way I teach my intro course generally. And then I just sort of amped it up in light of recent political events and really have made it, I think, a pretty good course, if I do say so myself. <laughs> is yeah. there, is there a good. perception with students coming into the colleges that, like Junita said, it is a perception I think I've had yeah. that philosophy is dry and boring. Yeah, and well, how do you attract them to these cl- classes? Because I think once they're in there, yeah. they'd be excited. Yeah, well, I mean, I did ask them the first day, you know, what do you think of when you hear the word philosopher? And multiple people said the equivalent of dead white male, right? I mean, that's <laughs> yeah. beard. Yeah. So, so I said, and I have two wonderful TAs, they're both women, and I said, well, we're here to challenge that, you know, understanding mm-hmm. of what philosophy is, because this is not what philosophy is, and this certainly isn't the future of philosophy. Um, So I think getting them in the door is the difficult thing. So Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, I did do a lot of advertising of the course. So we, I think, have 104 students in it right now. Um, But but showing them that um, the questions we'd ask, I think, are questions they care about. So the questions we're asking are, um, what can we know? So questions of skepticism. Is there a god? If not, then what? Um, What makes anything a person and the same over time? Uh, how should we organize ourselves politically, and then how do gender and race inform our lives? 
So I think making clear that the questions are ones that they already care about has been key in getting them mm -hmm. um, through the door. And then we're both struggling through historical texts by those dead white men um, and showing how they're relevant today. And then looking at a huge cross-section of people who look more like me or you who are asking and answering these questions. So that they see this is a living, breathing discipline. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, let's change gears here okay. for a moment. Okay. Probably not too far off of our topic, but this is a surprise question. Okay. And it was given to us by our producer, Mike Rosberg. And I don't know what's in here, and none of us here at the table knows what's in this envelope. Only Mike knows. Only Mike knows. <laughs> and now we will know, and we will discuss this topic for the okay. remaining eight minutes of I'm the program. I'm nervous because Mike was a philosophy major at the year, <laughs> so oh. I don't know. Oh. I'm sure you have a good argument. Oh. I hope so. Right. I hope so. <laughs> OK, let's see what, OK. It does have to do with philosophy. I mean. How is it possible to develop a philosophy of life when every person you meet and every circumstance you encounter is unique and different? Um, a how is it possible to develop a philosophy of life when every person you meet and every circumstance you encounter is different? Oh, wow. That's a really hard question. To me, that seems it like is. that would it's enhance right. the, uh, the ability to have a philosophy of life, because how far could you go with a philosophy on life if every person and every circumstance were the same? That is true. I also think that um, one of the keys is looking for commonalities. So while we appear to be very different from each other, I don't mm -hmm. think that that's really the case. I mean, I think, um, for instance, moral relativism is really popular these days. So is relativism about truth, generally. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that overall, people agree about certain things, right? So. Throwing a baby off of the Sears Tower is probably a bad idea. That's probably idea. wrong. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, I think if you start pressing people at the boundaries, they're going to mm -hmm. have responses that start matching up a lot more than you would expect. Right. Um, and but you can sometimes be surprised, too, by what you... I remember a, a game, board game called Scruples, and I'll never forget one of the other players, and I thought differently of him forever <laughs> afterwards. The question. It wasn't just a game. <laughs> no, it was a moral question about you go to someone's house, you bring a dog, and the dog scratches the, oh. the mm -hmm. couch and the wood. Uh, do you feel a responsibility to replace or repair that furniture? Yes. I just automatically thought everybody would say yes, but this yeah. one person at the table said, absolutely not. It's a dog. It wow. wasn't me. Ooh, and I can wow. leave it. Well, I see you think the same. So no yeah. extension as the owner parent of all. the dog, yeah. but yeah. that's their yeah. responsibility. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, in some ways, right, yeah, that I think the great diversity of the people you mm -hmm. meet does inform how you mm -hmm. think of things. Yeah, but I'm also not sure. I'd like to throw the question back to Mike. Yeah. What is a philosophy of life? Yeah. What is I don't even really know what That's that means. That's my question. I, I answer it with a question. Mm -hmm. Is there such thing as a philosophy of life? Yeah. Clearly there is, because they're that asking is. us a question. <laughs> <laughs> Stop yeah. questioning. Yeah. 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 about yeah. the philosophy of how, let's say, if you narrow it down, the philosophy of how I might go through life, mm -hmm. some of the basic mm -hmm. tenets that I might live my life too. I could maybe channel that mm -hmm. down into there. You might have a different of course, philosophy yeah. set of moral channels. That person who didn't take responsibility for his dog has clearly a different set. Yeah. So, so what I hear you saying then is that the philo a philosophy of life is different for everyone. For each person. That, that it's impossible to develop a philosophy of life that that applies to all of humanity. Is that? I would say mine would not say? necessarily ap apply to other people. Yeah, I guess. And that's Jessica, true. how would you deal with that? The, saying that that is. I feel like this is kind of like when you get into a cab, and now I'm betraying that I was in New York for three years, but <laughs> and Chicago before that, and someone says, you know, the cab driver says, "So what's your philosophy?" Once they yeah. find out what you do, because I always chat with them, you know, um, and I say. I what do you say one. to that? Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't have my own philosophy. Um, so most of my research really is about, um, you know, the past 
Um, and I think that there's really important stuff we can learn about going into those historical texts and seeing that they were grappling with questions that we're grappling with today. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't really have a philosophy of well, I see it way that, simpler. That, that brings it around to when we think of a philosopher, yeah. we automatically expect, I do, I shouldn't say we, I automatically expect that they're going to tell me how I should think about oh. something. Mm -hmm. yeah, you, you think about Plato and Socrates. But Socrates did exactly the opposite. Socrates okay. asked questions okay. of the people who were so-called experts until they got so pissed at him that they decided <laughs> he'd be better off dead, right? So, right. I mean, I think that this points to the difference between, I guess, my approach to teaching and maybe mm -hmm. um, the professor that you had. I mean, I see my role as not, you know, pouring knowledge into the students, but rather Helping extracting, them get drawing it, it exactly. out, exactly, yeah. figuring out how to get knowledge for themselves. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. So extracting well, it via questioning or. Mm -hmm challenging them with a question they haven't thought about or having them read a text that's so unlike anything they've encountered before. Um, so some students love that and some students are just mad because the question is, is this going to be on the test, you know? Yeah. When, when I think of that question of philosophy of life, I think about how you experience and live life and mm -hmm. especially with how society is right Your now approach. and it's so polarizing yeah. mm -hmm. and people that you thought you knew and you have relationships with yeah. and whatever side people fall on and if it's very different almost um, right now it's if you're thinking differently it's almost um, combative um, I think it makes you continue to look at how do I live life or view life um, another thing I think about when I think about philosophy of life because it's big on my mind right now is white privilege mm -hmm. um, because I feel like so many people don't acknowledge it because when they acknowledge it it's like you're blaming them or and so for me right now, that's something I'm, is a part of how I see life and how do I get across this message of how I view it, but also take in what your perspective is. Um, so I guess I see that question as just sort of how, you know, sort of my baseline is where I grew up, because that's kind of guiding how I view the world, you mm -hmm. know, my values were just kind of set there and information from my parents. And then as I live life and accumulate more and more experience, it's going to shape how I interact with the world. Yeah. And from that, that's how I'm going to approach the world or give off. And that's going to be sort of how I live life or see life. That's what I'm reading yeah. into that. No, that the sounds... Approach, mm -hmm. approach yeah. to one's life. Yeah, yeah. that sounds mm -hmm. exactly right. I, I think that you hit upon something super important um, that I think philosophy can lend a hand in too, and that is given how polarized things are right now, the real challenge is to see how anyone on the other side of the debate could ever have the position they have. And this is a problem I've had actually with people in my own family right now. I mean, how could you believe the things you believe? Um, and I think that that's one of the great skills that philosophy can also give you is the ability to inhabit someone else's shoes, right? Mm -hmm. And think like, okay, if I grew up in this set of circumstances being told these things, being fed this kind of media, mm -hmm. I guess I could see why I would think that, even mm -hmm. though from this other perspective, I think that that is precisely the wrong thing to think. Even mm -hmm. though it's so, clearly wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think yeah, that is opinion. an excellent point, right? We, we really do need to bridge the gap so that we can make progress. Right. Rather I, than I just, you know, hitting each other at every mm -hmm. every turn. Well, this is fantastic and we're running out mm -hmm. of time, but I have found the discussion exciting and wonderful mm -hmm. and enlightening. Thank you all for being here today as my co-hosts and guests. And thank you for watching It's a Woman's World. We'll see you next time. <laughs>